was a rainy Thanksgiving. We have a small family, so our gatherings are usually intimate. The dinner at my mom's house included my mom, my two sisters, our grandparents, and me. My older sister, Nancy, had moved out years ago, while my younger sister, Jamie, and I still lived at home with our mom. Our grandparents, who lived just 20 minutes away, were joining us too. Our dad's side of the family, residing in a different town, wasn't present. Everyone pitched in with the cooking. Our grandma brought over some dishes as well. We always had Thanksgiving dinner at 6 p.m. sharp. Our grandparents arrived around 5 p.m. and we braved the rain to help them up the front stoop, cautious not to slip in the bad weather. Once inside, we turned on the football game in the living room. I joined my grandparents, watching the game with my grandpa, an avid Cowboys fan. Meanwhile, my sisters assisted our mom in the kitchen. The rainstorm outside lent a cozy, relaxing atmosphere to our evening, at least at first. When it was time to set the table, I went to help. By 6 p.m., we were all seated, facing a lavish spread despite our small number. There was turkey, leg of lamb, potatoes, stuffing, corn, cranberry sauce, cornbread, and more that I probably forgot. We enjoyed our meal with wine and conversation, eventually migrating to the living room to watch the football game. However, before the game ended, the doorbell rang. It was still pouring outside, and we weren't expecting anyone. Oh no, what if that's your father? Our mom speculated. For context, our parents don't speak to each other. But the thought of our father making a surprise visit wasn't entirely implausible. My mom asked me to check the door. At the door, I shouted through it, asking who it was. The sound of rain muffled a male voice on the other side. When I opened the door, a black man in a large rain jacket, hood up, stood there. He approached and yelled something through the storm door. It took me a couple of attempts to understand him. He was asking for food, claiming hunger, and mentioned something about karma for helping him. I told him to wait a moment, then went back to inform my mom. There was a man, possibly homeless or just very hungry, asking for food. My mom hesitated but my grandma urged us to give him something. So, I made a small paper plate of leftovers, considering the rain might ruin it. As I returned to the door, the man tried to open it. I cautioned him that it was locked, but his attempt to force entry made me wary. Still, I unlocked the door, and as I began to open it, he pulled it open with force, trying to push his way in. I reacted instantly, throwing the food and pushing him back, yelling for my sister's help. As Nancy came to assist in shutting the door, two more men appeared, rushing up the walkway. I managed to push the man out, closing and locking the door just in time. Then, ensuring the house was secure, I checked the backyard door. Being the only able-bodied man in the house, I felt a responsibility to protect my family, who were now understandably upset. We decided to call the police. While my mom called the authorities, I patrolled the windows. It was difficult to see through the rain, but I spotted a couple of men trying the back door before fleeing. When the police arrived, the scattered food on the porch was a stark reminder that those men hadn't come for charity. Our Thanksgiving nearly turned into a nightmare. Though my grandma's intention was kind, the world isn't always conducive to good deeds. We installed a doorbell camera shortly after. On that Thanksgiving day, I received a long text from an unknown number. It started with, Hey Melissa, hope your Thanksgiving is going well. I quickly realized the sender was Kevin a guy I considered a stalker and had never actually met. We matched on a dating app 
and exchanged messages and snaps for a while, but we never met in person. His obsessive behavior made me uncomfortable. When I politely declined his invitation for a date, citing a lack of common interests, his behavior turned more aggressive and even threatening. He got upset after seeing a snap story of me getting drinks with a friend, mistaking it for a date. That was when I blocked him on everything. Snapchat, Instagram, and his phone number. However, he continued to try to contact me through anonymous Instagram and Snapchat accounts, which I consistently blocked. Reading his message disgusted me. Kevin was trying to manipulate and threaten me, I replied, warning him that I would go to the police if he continued to contact me. As the evening wound down and family started to leave, I checked my phone again. The next message from Kevin was longer and filled with insults, revealing his narcissistic and sociopathic tendencies. I showed these messages to the remaining family members, and they were appalled. My mother suggested that I report the incident to the police the next day, which I planned to do. Upon returning to my apartment, which I shared with my friend Chelsea, I heard footsteps outside my room. I always lock my bedroom door at night out of habit, even though I trust Chelsea. When the footsteps approached, I called out for Chelsea, but there was no response. Receiving several texts from a third random number, one of which threatened me about my apparent residence, heightened my alarm. I tried to contact Chelsea but got no response. Eventually, I called my parents, and my dad rushed over. When he arrived, we discovered that the sliding window in the kitchen, large enough for someone to enter, was unlocked. The next morning, my dad accompanied me to the courthouse to file for a temporary restraining order against Kevin. After a lengthy legal process, I finally encountered him in court for the restraining order. The judge granted the extension of the restraining order against Kevin. While I could never prove he broke into my apartment, his threatening texts were evidence enough. The court ruled that if he ever contacted me again through any means, he would be arrested. He was a truly dangerous man, and I hoped he hadn't found anyone else to harass. Most of my family lives in a rural part of Central Florida, closer to the East Coast. My Uncle Ben, who was hosting Thanksgiving one year, has a house situated on a huge lake, shared with only about five other houses. I prefer not to disclose the specific location to protect my uncle's privacy, contrary to what you might imagine. His house isn't fancy. It's rustic, private, and spacious. Uncle Ben, a bit of a redneck, always makes our holiday gatherings more enjoyable. His hosting meant a full-blown party atmosphere, complete with music, cornhole, and coolers full of beer. We arrived at his house around 3 p.m. The day was spent drinking beer, snacking on chips and dip, and playing drinking games, card games, cornhole, and even basketball though the latter was short-lived with our beer and chip-filled stomachs. The music was blasting, creating an unusual yet fun Thanksgiving celebration. As it began to darken around 5.30 p.m., Aunt Mel and Uncle Ben started setting the dinner table under the big gazebo. By sunset, everything was ready, and we began eating. The gazebo was lit with lights that turned on as it got darker. By 6 p.m., it was almost pitch black outside. Uncle Ben insists on having Thanksgiving dinner outdoors, which adds to the fun. However, the fun was interrupted when my cousin pointed out a figure standing at the edge of the woods. Uncle Ben, slightly drunk, approached the figure, asking if they needed help. Halfway there, the figure turned and ran into the woods. Uncle Ben laughed it off attributing it to one of the local nuts. But Aunt Mel and I were unnerved. Later, I spotted the figure again, 
closer to the lake this time. My uncle, visibly annoyed and drunk, went towards the figure, who then ran off. We then noticed another person in the woods on the opposite side of the yard, alerted my cousin, my dad, and I stood up to address the situation, ready to assist Uncle Ben, my cousin, my dad, and I prepared to confront these mysterious individuals. But as we stood up, the second figure also vanished into the woods. Deciding it was time to clean up, we started clearing the table and bringing everything inside. With the gazebo now empty, we gathered in the living room, leaving the outdoor lights on as a precaution. The intruders didn't seem like mere children. Their presence on Thanksgiving was puzzling. We theorized they might be drunk teenagers or young adults without family gatherings, looking for trouble. Later, feeling the need for another beer, I headed back outside. Uncle Ben and my dad asked me to bring one for them too. As I approached the gazebo, a sense of unease washed over me, intensified by the now extinguished gazebo light. Hastily, I grabbed as many beers as I could hold, eager to return inside. But then, a chilling sound stopped me. One of the gazebo chairs scraping against the concrete. Turning, I saw a tall figure, about 6'5", moving around the table. I yelled for Uncle Ben and dashed back to the house. My dad and uncle, responding to my calls, emerged just as a loud banging echoed from the other side of the house. It sounded like someone hitting the siding with their hand. Seeing my uncle and dad genuinely scared heightened my own fear. We rushed inside, locking the door behind us. It felt as though the house was surrounded, and Aunt Mel quickly shut every curtain and blind, sensing that we were being watched. Breaking character, Uncle Ben called the police. It was a first for him to involve law enforcement in any situation. The call lasted about five to 10 minutes, after which we all waited in the living room, a palpable tension and unease filling the air. Thank you for providing the conclusion to your story. Here is the final revised segment in English. Suddenly, a loud bang on the glass shattered the quiet, followed by the sound of a window in the kitchen breaking. Aunt Mel yelled at Uncle Ben to get the old rifle from the closet. He responded, noting that it hadn't been loaded in years. Fortunately, the police responded quickly. The faint sound of a siren from the police car outside signaled their arrival. We discovered that someone had thrown a brick through the window, attached to a note that read, Leave now, which felt like a direct threat. Additionally, Uncle Ben's Trump flag went missing the next day, hinting at a possible political motive behind the attack. This seemed like the most realistic theory, considering that unless my aunt, uncle, and cousin were secretly terrible neighbors, there appeared to be no other reason for their house to be targeted, especially on Thanksgiving. The whole incident was a stark reminder that there are some truly disturbed individuals out there. <laughs>